Today, we close out our series on Richard Kuklinski. We'll start by taking a look at how he came to meet his second wife. Then we'll look at his ties to Roy DeMeo and the hits he was hired to carry out for the mobster. We'll also discuss Kuklinski's side hustles, including his porn dealings, his breaking and entering gang, and other possible murders. Finally, we'll discuss how the Iceman melted. I'm Mike. I'm Ian. And I'm Dave. If you thought your neighborhood ice cream truck was a nuisance, stick around. Turns out that Mr. Softy can be downright deadly. This is Necronomapod. I think it must have been something you said. <sighs> yeah. Obviously, but I don't know what it was. Could it be that I was challenging you and it sounded judgmental? Could be. Hmm. Yeah, it could be. It's, you've got me annoyed with you now. Yeah. That's the truth. How mad are you? Not bad. Pretty. I feel a little flushed. So that means that I've reached a point in my life that I'm a little annoyed. What would you like to do? Doesn't matter. I don't think it's gone to the point that I'm actually going to do anything stupid. Goddamn, that's a good ice cold beer. How's that whiskey? It's pretty tasty. I don't know if you guys had seen this. Um, I didn't, but I was made aware of it on, I guess, on one of our social medias. There was a huge debate going on. And uh, you never know what I'm just going to, you know, grab and decide, hey, we're going to use that as an intro. So I have a question for you guys. And apparently this was a very hot uh, topic. Um, when putting on your shoes and socks. <laughs> yes. Do you go <laughs> sock, sock, shoe, shoe, or sock, shoe, sock, shoe? I would put my, both socks on and then both shoes on. Okay. Yeah, rarely do I have the occasion to put socks and shoes on at the same time. Yeah. So I would most definitely, sure. almost exclusively, already have my socks on when it came time for the shoes. But uh, ignoring that, though, what do you do? I say would. say you were in a situation where you had to put them both on at the same time. I would put both of my socks on and then my shoes. Here's Here, I'll even go one step further. <laughs> I would put both of my socks on, then I would put my left shoe on, then my right shoe on, then I would go back and tie my left shoe, then I would tie my right shoe. So you're, you're a left How first. That? And that's interesting you brought that up. Now, I think we're unanimous. Both socks first, then both shoes. It is a very weird feeling to me to have one foot fully socked and shoed and like covered and the other foot just bare. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a mind weird. fuck. Yeah, that's odd. Yeah. Maybe that's how serial killers are actually mourned. We'll add that to our triad. That's, that's the 19th <laughs> thing on our triad. Um, for whatever reason, it was earlier today, I went to put on my pants and I had to use my right leg first. And I almost fell over. Oh, I would fall down. For yeah. Sure. If I, I almost that. fell over in my closet because I was like, wait, what? I, this is not how you get dressed. <laughs> had to take them off. Like didn't get them all the way on. Put the left leg in first yeah. and then was able to get in. That's bizarro universe. Yeah. I, I don't know what, like, I, I can't even remember. Maybe I was in a funk or just, you hmm. know, a haze in the early morning. I don't know. But I tried to do right leg first and I almost toppled over in my closet. So I'm a, I think I'm a left leader as well, Dave. Yeah. I'm still trying to come up with the scenario where you go from barefoot to put shoes on, though. Barefoot to socks to shoes. Yeah. At the same time, though. Like, when does that happen? Do people what if get like, dressed with their shoes, like, in their closet? Like, maybe people just like to be barefoot around the house. But then, like, if you're going to run the Target, it's the winter. You got to put on your socks. Really? I mean, I'm not a barefoot person ever. No, so I am all the time. I hate wearing socks. So no. you often go barefoot to sh sock and shoe and out the door. Yeah. Well, okay. I stand corrected then. I wonder if people thought this is the way this com conversation would go. <laughs> Not so much about how you put them on, but Dave befuddled by the fact that you should never have to go from one extreme to the other. Well, I guess because I put my socks on in the house when I get dressed, but I'm what not if, a savage, so I don't put my shoes on in the house right, <laughs> until no. I get ready to leave. We respect carpet. <laughs> What if you were like in like, like your slippers and so you, like you get out of bed in the morning, you just go barefoot into slippers. Now you got to run to the store. Now you have to do socks and shoes. Mm. But I guess still we put socks on because then we walk to like the garage and put your shoes on. Correct. Or to the front door, side yes. door, 
wherever. So this scenario does not arise in my personal life. You mean there's never a situation where you're walking with a pair of socks in your pocket out to your garage, sitting down on the step, putting on your socks, putting on your <laughs> shoes and saying, well, time to get to Home Depot. I cannot imagine that taking place No. <laughs> Apparently at Ian's house, it happens quite frequently, though. I just don't. I hate socks. So. But you still do sock, sock, shoe, shoe. Yeah. We've spoken. So we, we've officially put to rest that if you like pineapple on pizza, you're a psychopath. If you do sock, shoe, sock, shoe. You probably also are a psychopath. But like I put my socks on in my bedroom. You know, I don't, like, don't take them down to the door with me or anything. But you're still putting both socks on first. Yeah, I just throw my socks on and then I'm still walking around and stuff. And then I'll go down and put my shoes on as I'm leaving. It would be funny if you did half but the other way. And like you in your bedroom put on one sock and shoe. And the <laughs> other one was barefoot until you got down to the door and did the other sock and shoe. I mean, you like uncooked pizza, so just let's just go total crazy. All right. It's like in Steubenville, Ohio. That's how we do it. <laughs> we don't cook our pizza, and we put our shoes and socks on backwards. All right. Well, I'm glad we settled that. So, you know. The things that uh, people out there are thinking about. Yeah. Okay. They could be debating Richard Kuklinski, whether or not he was a hitman or a serial killer. He's a multifaceted individual. Either way, he seemed to enjoy it. He seemed to really take great pleasure in the torture aspect of it. Was it pleasure or indifference? I don't know. I don't know either. Maybe he got pleasure in the extra reward he would get mm. for it. Showing that, you know, he did that little something extra. Yeah. Well, let's dive in and find out more. Where we left off on part one, Carmine Genovese got out of jail from a two-year illegal gambling sentence and needed someone killed with proof. So Richard kidnapped the guy from the used car lot that he worked at, drove him out to the Pine Barren to New Jersey, smashed his knees and ankles, cut off his fingers, and then took his head back to Carmine. We ended part one saying Richard was officially a contract killer, and that's true to the point that he realized that he should be doing this for, uh, he should be killing people for money, and Carmine Genovese was really impressed with him. And Richard getting... 10,000 didn't last long. Like we said, he liked flashy shit. So he was still working in the trucking company after getting this $10,000. Like yellow suits. Yes. Flashy yellow suit. I still like to picture him unloading trucks wearing these fancy suits. <laughs> <laughs> One day at work, he walked up to buy a drink from the vending machines. And that's where he met the secretary of the trucking company, Barbara Padrisi. This is all their quick hey, how are you should have been, but Richard's boss had a thing for Barbara. So his boss told him to stay away, which in turn made Richard have the attitude of, you're not going to tell me what to do. Richard didn't even find Barbara attractive like that, but he pursued her out of spite and told his boss to fuck off that he quit his job. That evening, Richard went back to the trucking company to kill his boss, but instead he ran into Barbara again at the vending machines. Apparently she didn't do much work. <laughs> that's such a small like yeah his boss is an asshole but that's doesn't even really warrant even a physical confrontation no. let alone being killed you to kill him and quit your job and come back and kill him take this job and shove it richard told her about how he quit his job over her and barbara felt bad so she went out with richard to get coffee so he, she, uh, he thinks she's ugly and she feels bad for him. Match made in heaven. Yeah. This date went pretty good. And that weekend, Richard took her out to see a Godzilla movie and Casper the Ghost cartoons. They were both big fans of cartoons like that, especially Richard. He made sure to point out multiple times in the book that he watched Looney Tunes. Uh, one, because he loved them. And second, he used Looney Tunes for new ideas on way to murder people. He's big into Popeye. He used Popeye a lot. Stop too. it. <laughs> Looney Tunes, T-U-N-E-S, not T-O-O-N-E-S, as detailed in the Mandela effect. Correct. Popeye wasn't even a Looney Tune. I think Richard Kuklinski just liked all cartoons. Okay. And then he just, some stuff just stood out to him that he could do that in real life. I imagine him watching like a Roadrunner and Coyote and taking notes. <laughs> on all the ways that Coyote tried to kill Roadrunner. <laughs> we'll get some dynamite but, from the Acme dynamite right. company. But then at the end of each one, he's like, oh, that one backfired. Oh, that, well, that one backfired. That, you know, it just doesn't happen. He's trying to push boulders <laughs> off of, on people. Well, he specifically says that um, 
there's a Looney Tunes cartoon where uh, Bugs Bunny like looks through the peephole of a door and then on the other side is like Elmer Fudd or whatever with a gun waiting yep. for him. So Richard Kuklinski was like, oh yeah, that's that's a pretty good idea. So he did that, knocked on someone's door and he could see in there the peephole and the guy put his eye up. He just fucking shot I him. I remember that from the documentary, Damn. yeah. So he was for real using Looney Tunes <laughs> as source oh, material. Shit, man. It's not funny when you put it that way. <laughs> I think there's a there's a costume or what Richard calls a costume later in this story. He pulled that from Looney Tunes as well when Bugs Bunny dresses up. Or <laughs> <laughs> now that you say that, that sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. The Barbara is going to be the wife scene in the HBO documentaries and things like that. But like we talked about in part one, Richard was already married and had two kids with Linda. According to Richard, at this point, he hadn't seen Linda in months because she cheated on him with one of his friends. Richard said that he caught the two of them in a motel room where he beat his friend within an inch of his life and cut off Linda's nipples, then left. Do you ever think about that when you're out cucking wives, Mike, that a, a Richard Kuklinski husband type might show up? Look, you could beat me within an inch of my life as much as you want. You don't touch my nipples. <laughs> okay. We draw the line there. It's pretty brutal cutting the nipples off. And who knows if that even happened. There's that that's one of the things with him yeah. that we're gonna get into this part. Not so much in part one, but the stuff in part two, there's a lot of uh issues with corroborating some of the things he's he says he did. <laughs> I think that's right. Yeah. Also, I'm inclusive with it. Like I'm not gonna do it out of spite and if the guy doesn't want it. It's his fantasy too, right? Just trying to make it enjoyable for him and her. So you need the husband's approval for your cucking business. I certainly would like him to be a part of it. Yeah, sure. understood. understood. I mean, unless it's a spike cuck, then you just, you know, you go for the kill. <laughs> spike <laughs> cuck. Barbara was the type, of, um, the type of woman you see in Goodfellas or Sopranos, that like stereotypical good girl Italian. She was sheltered and never was around mob guys. So she is going to claim that she never knew anything about what Richard did for money, but she was warned by her family. Her mother didn't like Richard right off the bat, but it sounded more like an issue that Richard was Polish and not Italian. Barbara's aunt felt the same way, but she got mob vibes from Richard. So she hired a private investigator to look into him. The private investigator came back and told Barbara's aunt, like, yeah, this guy's involved in all kinds of shit. But that didn't stop Barbara from dating Richard. And that isn't all, Barbara being naive. After one of their first few dates, Barbara told Richard that she might want to see other people, to which Richard put a knife in her back and said that she was his now. Guess she grew on him, huh? It's a possessive pal. I mean, just like the possessive control, individual, huh? Right? Just yeah. the control. I'm confident he didn't give a shit about her. Property. Right. She eventually gets pregnant. Um... And we're going to talk about domestic violence in a minute here, but that started pretty quick. And she actually kind of ran away from him when she got pregnant and went down to Florida with a family member. But the thought of having a daughter, a single mother daughter was enough for her mother to tell Richard where she was. And he went down to Florida and brought her back. Wow. Like pretty much against her will. It was like once he got there, she just kind of was like, all right, I guess I'm just going to accept my life. Mm. But they knew he was a piece of shit. It was just because of that whole yeah. stigma of being uh, being a single mother. Yeah, right. So Barbara and Richard got married in 1961. And what about the other wife? Yeah, I don't know. It just kind of, it sounded like he filed paperwork. She's out of the picture now. Yeah, that's right. like literally the last thing you hear is he cut off her nipples and then that's oh. just kind of it no corroboration on that that's just what he said and that's it so he just became infatuated with being with barbara then it was just like all right well that's it for that and and like we said before by the time he met barbara he hadn't seen linda in months the pictures you see of him online like if you google him with family he's with a woman and two kids is that with barbara or was that with uh linda i'd have to see okay who the lady was i'll find it while you're talking In 1961, they got married and had two daughters, Merrick, Kristen, and a son, Dwayne. Later in life, Barbara said that there were two sides of Richard, good Richie and bad Richie. 
good Richie would have love songs played in restaurants while Barbara walked in and stayed up all night with the kids when they were babies. While on the other hand, bad Richie would leave and not come home for days or months without telling Barbara anything. Brutal domestic violence. Like, for example, the first time she got pregnant, like when they, when she came back from Florida, Richard beat her so bad that she gave a partial birth to the baby. Like the leg came out of her, which obviously resulted in her losing the baby. Um, His daughter, Merrick, and she was considered his favorite, um, talked about Richard killing her dog in front of her as punishment for not coming home on time. He says it in the book multiple times that he never hit his kids. Like it's this thing he should be, um, you know, praised for. But I mean, everything else was just as bad as his dad. Mm. This is it. I'm guessing it's with Barbara because it's with two daughters. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In 1962, Barbara's uncle got Richard a job at the 20th Century Deluxe Film Lab in Manhattan. Um, he wasn't murdering at this time, and there was no organized crime stuff like this. Was I've just- taken a break from the murdering <laughs> lifestyle. Yeah, it's like he kind of tried to, you know, straight and narrow life. Yeah, for a bit here, but it didn't last long because he figured out how to make exact copies of the films. Like not even like bootlegs of where you got a camera in the back. Like he was right. making direct copies of these movies. That's pretty lucrative, I bet. Especially yeah. with the burgeoning, you know, home VHS. Uh- or home VCR market at that time. And he was selling them to theaters and stuff. Like he wow. would go, he would go with, um, and we're going to talk about this, this whole movie business goes pretty deep within the mob, but there were, uh, theaters he would sell to. And they, you know, instead of buying the rights to a Disney movie from Disney, they would get it like $500,000 cheaper from Richard. So he was making actual like film prints. We're not even talking about home VHS stuff. Wow. No, okay. he was straight up. Co- he would stay up all night. Wow. Just copying these to, and he was making bank. I bet. An enterprising young man. You got to afford that lifestyle he liked so much. Yeah. So this bootlegging business eventually led Richard back into organized crime and into murder. Richard hired a crew of guys and they stole a whole truck of Casio watches. The Casio watches were sold to a guy named Phil Solomeni, who's going to turn out to be a very important person in this story. When Richard sold the watches to Phil, Phil was in the porn business, but really off the rail shit like bestiality and stuff. And Richard found out real quick that he could make a lot more money bootlegging this stuff than, uh, than Disney movies in the, crazier the shit like bestiality sold the best i used to have a good bestiality <laughs> boot, bootleg vhs I, I, I think you brought I knew this he up was about four say or five times <laughs> as soon oh, as i wrote I, about this you know, i knew you were gonna right, move it. along i don't know no, i'd like to hear it i about. think you're out of material pal <laughs> <laughs> you're recycling old stories i'd like to hear about it yeah, again. it could have been on a bonus show though so uh, it was called rover trigger fido and friends <laughs> Seriously, I don't want to. I don't know what happened to it, but where'd you get that from? I have no idea. Just old VHS shit floating around in the well, probably late eighties, early nineties. Were you in this video at all? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Seemed to be like I don't know East Germans, things like that. But yeah, it was wild. I think there was an eel in one scene. Oh my god, that's wild. <laughs> <laughs> it's all kinds of stuff. Are you allowed to kink shame when it involves animals? Yeah. And that's, you know, then yeah. it's a cruelty. Yeah, you're breaking the law. There's no consent in the animal world with those. Sure. Did any of the animals appear to be enjoying it, though, Dave? <sighs> I think they all were, Mike. No, I have not. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I think it's like to be, like, cucked by a dog. Like if you're watching your wife bang out, like, a German shepherd or something. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not I, happy it's with a different the different scene. I, I don't know. <laughs> I just felt like I had to ask. I mean, it probably exists or not even probably. It definitely exists somewhere online. Dog cucking? I'm sure it does. Maybe you, you, <laughs> I'm not even going to go. <laughs> you can expand your vi- business and dress up like a furry and go out there like as a German shepherd. Well, that would be, I mean, the furry <laughs> business seems to be pretty huge, right? Like that's a whole yeah. thing. Aren't there conventions like furry conventions and stuff? Absolutely. There are. Yeah. All right. Furry, like <laughs> sounds, awfully, furry cuck. sounds awfully hot, though. I don't know if I can, I can work in that those conditions. Need a lot of air conditioning for that. Yeah. Like inside the furry costume. Right. Yeah. I'm not sure those exist. No. And I have to buy my own because I'm not wearing a rental. Yeah, sure. 
And I have, then I have one of those in my closet. Fucking fall over, putting my right leg first in that thing. He dies. They dies <laughs> half in his Correct. furry cuck German Shepherd outfit, <laughs> bleeding from my head, <laughs> half erect because I was getting ready to go. <laughs> Looks like he was barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> oh boy! So after a while of doing the bootleg porn stuff, Richard figured he would start filming porn, working on consignment deals. Then he started financing porns and filming them in an abandoned warehouse in New Jersey. Those consignment deals were through mob connections, specifically through Roy DeMeo, who at this time was like just a step away from being a made guy in the Gambino crime family out of New York. How this worked was the film company who owned the cameras and all that kind of stuff got in debt with Roy DeMeo. So, DeMeo just rolled in and said, instead of killing you, I just own this company now. So the consignment deal was that Richard would make these porns and then pay 60% or something like that to DeMeo. The turnaround on profit with these films was slow, like slower than Richard thought. And um, he got on DeMeo's bad side. Mm. I bet those films had more bush than every nursery in town combined. (laughs) (laughs) Just a wild guess. (laughs) I cannot imagine there were great porns being made in an abandoned warehouse in New Jersey. You have a you have a real big thing for where porn was made. Remember our yeah, uh, yeah, apartment yeah. wrestling conversation? That's and you were weird, like, man. you can't just go in someone's like apartment and wrestle while some guys just sitting there. It just seems so skeevy. Yeah. So does this. This sounds terrible. So you want the big production companies only. You want the elaborate set, the five star hotel, like the big mansions in, the, in mansions. the valley. That's where he needs his porn filmed. Yeah, I guess. I'm not judging. I'm just not learn, an abandoned learn warehouse. Learn something about you. Learn something about you. Yeah. What about in a stable out in the East German countryside? <laughs> but what if it's a stable in East German countryside, but it's me in a furry costume, <laughs> banging someone's wife? Nothing else. Would I watch that or just saying is that okay? Yeah, that's all right. All right. It would have to be like in the fall or winter though. I'm not. It's too hot, man. Too hot, and the smell of shit. Come on. What do you want from me? <laughs> I'm good. I'm not that good. <laughs> I just like the thought, the fact that like the furry costume just has like a little hole, like where the dangle comes out. Oh, and a a, a poop hole too, in case you got to squat, right? Sure. Why hmm. not? We'll put holes take right that costume off and on all day long. Right. Uh, that's a lot of work. I'm talking myself out of this idea. I think I'm out of the furry business. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Take long. That's too much. Getting to Roy DeMeo, if we're basing this off, um these type of episodes on brutality. This series should have been about Roy DeMeo. He is one of the scariest individuals I have ever read about. Like all the mob movies where there's a guy that's a loose cannon. That's who Roy DeMeo was. Richard had his rules where he would say that he would never kill a woman or child, but Roy DeMeo didn't care. He would have a whole family killed if he felt that it was warranted. And with Richard, there's some debate about how many people he killed with how he said that he was going around killing all those homeless people with Roy DeMeo. It really isn't a bit, isn't a debate. He was responsible for at least 200 murders. Allegedly. Is it allegedly or is he responsible? And for, if you tallied up informants, <laughs> what they said in trials and things, I mean, I buy it, I guess, but Hey, I don't want to cast aspersions against the mafia for things they've never been convicted of. So, are you telling me I'm right throwing now? the allegedly in there because I <laughs> personally am not aware of any convictions related to these murders. Are you telling me right now you're afraid that you're going to get beaten with a bat and then buried alive? I'm. Well, because I am. <laughs> I 100% would be. I just have no firsthand knowledge of this. So I'm going to say allegedly because I, uh, I, I don't know. 200 murders is what Ian said. 200 murders. I have no firsthand knowledge of that. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot confirm nor deny that that actually took place. In the late 60s and into the 70s, DeMeo formed his own crew, and they earned the nickname the Murder Machine. DeMeo also had a very specific method of murdering and disposing of bodies that was eventually called the Gemini Method, because DeMeo's hangout was the Gemini Lounge. How it would work was that they would lure a victim through the side door of the lounge and into the apartment in the back of the building. Then DeMeo would come out from the side with a silenced pistol in one hand and a towel in the other, shooting the victim in the head and then wrapping the towel around their head immediately to stop the blood flow. 
Then as soon as this happened, another member of the crew would stab the victim in the heart to stop blood from pumping out of the gunshot wound. Then the body would be stripped and dragged into the bathroom where it would be hung upside down for the rest of the blood to drain out. This was so it wouldn't be so messy for the next step when crew members would place the body onto plastic sheets laid out in the main room to dismember it, cutting off the arms, legs, and head. Richard said one of the first times he went to the Gemini Lounge, he had to go to the bathroom, and when he went in, there was a dead body hanging upside down in the shower with a tub full of blood, and when Richard came out, DeMeo said, did you see the guy in there taking the shower? And it started laughing like it was the, the funniest shit ever. It's like a slaughterhouse in there. It got nicknamed the slaughterhouse, too, <laughs> after a while. Terrifying. And Richard said it smelled in there. Like, you could smell a fucking dead body. It was just hanging upside down, and they were sitting in there eating a, oh, God. eating dinner and stuff, just joking about it. That's crazy. So, like we said, Richard got behind on money with the mayo. So, DeMeo went to pay Richard a visit, and during that conversation, Richard got smart with him. DeMeo pistol whipped the shit out of Richard and then broke his nose with the butt of a shotgun. Richard said at that moment he knew that he would eventually kill DeMeo for pistol whipping him like that, but he knew that he would have to wait that out. He couldn't just get all crazy and go out and kill Roy DeMeo. Richard paid DeMeo his money, and things went back to how they were with the filming porn. Through guys in New Jersey, DeMeo heard about how cold-blooded Richard was regarding murder and one day went to Richard and told him that he'd give him a job being a contract killer for murders DeMeo didn't have time to do himself. DeMeo took Richard for a drive and said that it was going to be like a job interview. He parked the car after a while of driving and pointed out a random guy walking his dog. DeMeo told Richard, just go kill that guy. Without hesitation, Richard got out of the car, walked up behind the guy, and shot him in the back of the head using a gun with a silencer. And with that, Richard was a contract killer for the Gambino crime family. Cold, man. Cold. I'm going to ask the question all the listeners want to know. What happened to that dog? Um, Probably just ran away, maybe. And lived a happy life on some farm out in the countryside. That's how I like to envision it. Okay. Isn't that interesting how you can you can beat someone like that, pistol whip them, break their nose with a shotgun, and just go back to work your normal working relationship? Like if I took this microphone stand and broke Mike's nose, right there, <laughs> yeah. like would we be okay recording the show tomorrow? You think? Uh, no, we wouldn't. I don't know if we'd be a podcast anymore. <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> I mean, I certainly would. Probably wouldn't. I'd be in the hospital. I would imagine. <laughs> Dave has an infatuation with busting my face open. Why did you say that? It was the bonus show we did the other day. <laughs> or it was a few months ago. And somehow you were like, yeah, but I'll just take your face and throw it through a wall. And like, we'll see how you were comparing oh. me to like, to how Dale Earnhardt died. You're like, <laughs> want to throw your face through a wall and we'll see. That got edited out, I believe. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that rightfully so. Off, that went way <laughs> well, that was rails. horrible. I don't even remember saying it, but I'm glad that me Earnhardting, you didn't make it to the show. <laughs> yeah. God damn. I'm, I'm just saying. Nice. There seems to be a theme. <laughs> I might have to hire some personal security. (laughs) Dave and all of our one-star reviews have infatuation with seeing my face busted open. (laughs) I mean, I guess in the end, holes is holes, right? So if my face is busted open, use it wisely. You get painkillers. It'll be a better show. It'll be all right. I've been advised not to do shows on (laughs) painkillers. By myself the following day. By myself. (laughs) I'd like to introduce everyone to Morphine Mike. Morphine Mike's joining us from his hospital gurney. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. the problem is that then morphine mike then still has his whiskeys and his beers and then it becomes <laughs> shit show mike so richard was hired to do murders that DeMeo couldn't get to and he eventually worked for other families as well but his first big hit was out of state down in miami the target had raped a 14 year old girl who was the daughter of an associate of a maid guy They knew full well who this guy was, but he was wearing a bandana when he raped her, so the girl couldn't point him out in the lineup. Once Richard found his target in Miami, he let the air out of the guy's tires and waited. When the guy started looking at his tires, Richard attacked him, handcuffed him, duct taped his mouth shut and his ankles together, and then threw him in the van. Richard then drove the van to a remote area and tied the guy to a palm tree. Using his bare hands, Richard ripped the guy's balls off and then with a combat knife, cut his dick off and put it in a plastic bag to take back to New York as proof. 
then Richard started to cut pieces of skin off the guy, like just like slabs of meat pretty much and would pour salt in the wounds. And then when Richard felt that he had tortured the guy enough, he cut open his stomach to let his intestines pour out, then dragged the guy to the water, put a life jacket on him and threw him in the ocean to let the sharks eat him. This sounds like that medieval torture show we did. Uh, like this is brutal stuff. This guy is either just the craziest lunatic we've ever talked about or just has an incredible imagination. Yeah, I'm not sure I buy any of this. How do you rip a guy's balls off with your bare hands? I'm not sure. I bet you could do that. I don't know. Richard was very strong. He was like an, it said to be like an abnormally strong guy. Like I've scratched Maybe. too hard before and I felt like I ripped my nuts off. <laughs> like sure. I don't think it's too but hard. But it's a sensitive area. It always <laughs> feels worse than it is. <laughs> like if you have... If you have enough I, adrenaline not, going on, I'm not you're saying mad it's impossible. Like I just, I'm not sure. You know, could this guy just do it? I think it's probably pretty easy to, with your bare hands, rip someone's ball sack <laughs> off. <laughs> I mean, because after that, I believe the rest of the story. That's the only part of the story that I was like, mm. oh, I don't believe that. And I still, I have, I doubt that. We talked earlier about, you know, whether he derives pleasure from this. I, I think maybe he does. Does this is just off the chart? That's what cruelty, I mean. Like right? he just does one. Like you could have stopped at any one of these, and he just keeps going. If you, in fact, did rip a man's balls off with your bare hands, at that point, you don't even need to touch the dick. Like, who, who gives a shit? Yeah. Like, you've, you've just ripped a guy's ball off, balls off with your bare hands and then throwing him in the water for the sharks. Like, I don't know. Why would, you know, I yeah. don't know. It's, it's a, well, and, and even if you needed to bring the, the, the cock and balls back to New York as proof, you could do it post-mortem. Like, you don't, you can kill the guy. You can shoot the guy in the forehead first and then do it. You don't need to put them through that and have them alive. Why? If you're just a strictly professional right. assassin, guys don't operate like that. Richard said that the most of the hits that he was paid by the crime families to do were ones where they specifically wanted people to suffer. Mm. He was the guy to go to when you wanted somebody yeah. to suffer. He was he, the ice man. Yeah, but still, I, they wouldn't know whether. Right. Yeah. Like, so he obviously derived some pleasure from it. He said Why the. the Go ahead. The one quote that he said was something along the lines of um, when someone needed to see hell before they were actually there. That's who I was. Ugh. Why the life vest when he threw him in the water for the sharks? Make can the last bo- longer? Can but can the body not go go down and the sharks just get them and find them? You drown like, right away if there's no sharks around. This way you're floating there and they're, you're ensuring that the sharks will eat you. Would be my guess. I mean, yeah, you're still going to live for a, a little while. I mean, I assume that he was dead. No, he was still alive. He just cut, stabbed him in the stomach and just let his intestines come out a bit. Gotcha. Oh, okay. So he was still alive. So let him hang out there a little bit Man, until the sharks come. I was going to say this is one of the most unimaginable deaths, but then I think we're going to get to one even worse next. So like you guys are saying, this sounds like unbelievable, like something out of a movie. But there's some evidence that at least puts Richard in the area at that time. On his way back to New Jersey, Richard was cut off on the highway in South Carolina by a car. There were three guys in the car and they started fucking around with Richard, like speeding up and slowing down. And then one of them flipped him off. One of them giving Richard the finger was enough that they needed to die. So Richard pulled off to the side of the road. And as these three young guys got out of the car, Richard shot all three of them and then drove away. There were newspaper articles about this unsolved murder, so we at least know Richard is telling the truth about this part and that he was probably in Miami for the hit, but who knows about the whole shark thing and all that kind of stuff. But he was at least there. Yeah. You know, I don't doubt that he did almost all of these killings. It's just the extent of the torture, right? Like, that's what we're really questioning. He kind of, we'll see towards the end, we'll talk about it a bit, but he goes off the rails with like claiming that he killed uh, Jimmy Hoffa. And, you know, Roy DeMail, a lot of that stuff is considered to be not true. Wait, Roy DeMail dies? Spoiler alert. Jesus <laughs> Christ, man. Come on. Damn it. All right, I'm going home. Also, if you look up, fuck around and find out on uh, Wikipedia, you see the story of these three clowns in South Carolina. Really? Is, no, no, not oh. really. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Sorry. a good idea. You really had them there for a minute. Damn it. <laughs> I thought somebody was being fun. I hope Fuck Around and Find Out has its own page on Wikipedia. (laughs) 
Yeah, fucking no, for, around for, in cars and road rage and no. stuff is not a good idea. Look, there was a little part of me that when you when I read those few sentences about them fucking with him and then him killing them, I was like, yeah. <laughs> well done. Look, Just I, this one part of the story. That's it. Look, and I, I shouldn't call them clowns. I apologize. They're three murder victims. That's inappropriate, but yeah. There's always the possibility. Sounds like they you, tried to make him a murder victim. You can, you know, you always possibility you fuck with the wrong person on a, on a on a highway like that. So don't do it. Look, when you start using a car to fuck around with people like that, yeah, you you're putting know. that person's life and your life, your passengers, and everyone around you's life in danger. And everyone has a gun these days. Well, yeah, that, they got really unlucky with that part. Yeah. In the third documentary, that's when he's talking to Park Dietz, and it's about this story. And he said it's not, it wasn't even the fact that they were driving like assholes or whatever. It's the fact that one of them flipped them off. The middle finger was like, all right, well, I'm going to fucking kill you now. And that's when Park Dietz challenges that. And he's like, is that, do you really think that that is a capital offense? Yeah. And that's when um, Richard said, I, you got me annoyed with you now <laughs> that that pissed there him are off. People that really get offended by the middle finger, I guess. Is there really? Oh, yeah. I don't understand it, but people mm. get really upset by it. Mm. I've been known any to flip of... people off when I'm driving. Yeah. I do it all the time. Yeah. I'm oh, a I very should, angry driver. I should have been shot a hundred times. <laughs> <by now. laughs> I've also then I read shit like this. I'm like, uh-huh. yeah, I've also <laughs> wanted to shoot a hundred people. And I'm like, thank God that, you know, I'm not really an aggressive person. I just get fucking pissed off in my car. Mm -hmm. But like. You know, you take an extra second too long at the stop sign. You're getting a double bird from me and, a, and a extra, like a 30 second honk. Like everyone in the in the vicinity is going to know that you fucked up an extra second. <laughs> I got places to go, man. I'm yeah. busy, busy boy. They call me busy boy, Mike. That's a good thing. I don't go out much and drive. <laughs> Another job Richard did that is highlighted a lot in the book. Uh, and documentaries was one involving rats. Uh, there was a young guy probably in his 20s started dating the daughter of a maid guy. And this maid guy asked him what his intentions were with his daughter. And in a smart ass way, this this guy said, just having fun, which was not the right thing to say. I'm just banging her out. See, <laughs> it sounded like <laughs> I wish you would have said that. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like it would be inappropriate just for anybody like, yeah. You know, if someone came to date your daughter and they're like, yeah. oh, yeah, we're just having fun. Like, oh, we're just going to fuck around. Yeah. yeah. Don't say that. Yeah. no. But maybe you should know who your who this girl's father is. And also that not the right thing to say, perhaps. This guy was a straight up Sicilian made man. Well, that is not something to fuck around with. I wouldn't even date that daughter. I would be <laughs> like, I, right. would, I would be just always nice to her and just respectful so respectful that I would stay like 30 feet away from her at all times. So as not to be confused with someone that was fucking around and about to find out. Just look at the just, ground the whole time. Yeah. yeah. And that's it. Ooh, I was not <laughs> of any part of that. <laughs> Richard knew about a cave that was filled with hundreds of rats. And that seems super random just hearing about that. But Richard liked to hunt. And when he wasn't murdering people, he stumbled upon this cave one day. So Richard took this guy to the cave and restrained him where he couldn't move. Then he tied wet rawhide strips to his arms, head, and balls. The rawhide served two purposes. One, when it dried, it would shrink. So as this rawhide dried, it was just getting tighter and tighter around this guy's forehead and his balls. And then two, the rats would smell the rawhide. And like clockwork, they gradually started to come out and bite this guy. The whole time this was going on, Richard took some Polaroids as proof and then left. Richard said he came back two days later and the rats had eaten almost all of the guy. Uh, this is uh, brutal. Um, I, I've never seen a, I don't think a rat in person. I don't think. Not even like in a pet store or something. I'm, I, I'm not sure. Maybe I have, but like. Or in the, the subway way, in New York city. Yeah, I've not, I've not <laughs> but like, and we've talked about on the show. You guys do not like spiders. Right. I, I don't give a fuck about spiders. The way you guys are with spiders. I am with mice. And to me, rats are just bigger, badder, more terrible species of mice. So, yeah, like if Dave, if you were if you told me right now, oh, yeah, earlier today we caught a, my, a mouse, you know, in my basement, I would be looking at the floor and uncomfortable the rest of the time I was here. 
I do not. I can't do it. Yeah. Now thinking about rats and then eating you alive. It's the worst. That is. It's the absolute worst. I'm going to have a nightmare about that tonight. That is just, for me the worst. Just makes me think of Game of Thrones. When they put the rat in the bucket now against I'm the guy's for, stomach. Oh, you talked about that on the... Uh, medieval torture show, yeah. 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 Ooh. It just gnaws through you. I can't do that. They're just such disgusting little things. It, this punishment seems excessive for just a flippant remark to your girlfriend's father. I don't I don't know if there's more of the story. I don't know if Richard's uh, exaggerating what took place here, but it seems like the punishment doesn't fit the crime here. Yeah. Right? That's harsh. That's harsh. Like, you know. So does he not enjoy this? You're not indifferent going to this much trouble. Yeah, you'd have to. If you're right? indifferent, you just throw the guy off a fucking bridge. Yeah. Like, these were the greatest hits, I guess. The book is, um, the book that I used for this is 630 pages long. Like, there are tons of murders that he talks about that's like, man, that seemed pretty petty to go to mm -hmm. make somebody suffer like that. Mm. I don't know, man. Or was this just like in his mind? He just, you know, had a lot of time to build himself up and think about, I'm going to make my sound, myself sound like a, a even harder badass than I actually was. There's no way to tell. Yeah. I think there's probably some of that with, with this because he had a huge ego, you know. Well, think, did we I ever see right. the videos or photos that he allegedly took of the rats eating these people? No. Richard said that he got an extra 10000 for being creative. So he started doing this to victims more and more. Back in part one, we briefly said that Richard would try different methods of murder to see if he could feel anything. Eventually, with these rats, he started leaving a video camera behind to film the victim being eaten. He said when he watched those back, it gave him a feeling that he didn't like. He said nervous, but he couldn't really figure it out. I think it's safe to say nervous wasn't what he was feeling, but he, I don't think he truly ever had a feeling. Like when he says that he doesn't know what feelings are, I think he's completely truthful in that. Mm. But whatever this did to him, he just, he didn't like it and could never figure out how to describe it. Did it stop him from using the rat torture going forward? No, it did oh. not. So I bet it was ex probably excitement. He and said, maybe he was feeling that was nervousness. He said the only adrenaline rush, this is what he told Park Dietz, was the only adrenaline rush he ever got was just from missionary sex, just normal sex. That's it. That's the only feeling he's ever had. That's so crazy. It's like an adrenaline rush from that. That's the only thing he could think of besides this. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Relationships can take work, especially the most important one you can have in your life, your relationship with yourself. A lot of us will drop anything to go help someone we care about. We'll go out of our way to treat other people well. But how often do we give ourselves the same treatment? Whether it be exercising, putting down your phone for a while, having a chat with a close friend, or just simply taking a nap, we need to make sure we're taking care of ourselves just as you would take care of a friend. And with that in mind, this month, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you that you matter just as much as everyone else does, and therapy is a great way to make sure you show up for yourself. Your mental health should be taken seriously. Nothing can cripple your day or stunt your motivation more than feeling depressed, anxious, or sad. We all have a lot to deal with in our daily lives, be it the struggles of work, keeping food on your table, or even paying the bills. Your mental health is one area that you shouldn't have to worry about. Whether life currently has you down or you're feeling unfulfilled, we're all experiencing our own form of strain on our mental health. And for that, BetterHelp is here for us. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you could be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Necronomapod listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Necro. So give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Necro. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Necro. And thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring today's podcast. In 1976, Carlo Gambino died from natural causes, and Carlo appointed his brother-in-law, Paul Castellano, as acting boss before he died. 
Paul Castellano was not great at being the boss of a crime family, and one of his numerous mistakes was making Roy DeMeo a made guy. Once DeMeo became a made guy, there was a ton of cocaine involved, and DeMeo and his crew ramped up their murder operation. That cocaine was making their behavior super erratic as well. Like the kind of shit where they're sitting at, you know, eating food or sitting in the Gemini lounge and he would just like grab an Uzi. Like Richard tells a story where he grabs this Uzi and picks it up and he's like, I heard you've been ratting out. You know, I heard you were a rat, Richard, and like cock the Uzi pointing at him and then it's silence and he's like, oh, I'm just fucking with you and stuff nonstop with stuff like that. How can you live your life like that with that degree of stress when you might you know, get murdered at any second? Like, what's that life like? I think about that all the time. Every time I watch Goodfellas, Casino, any of that shit, I'm like, yeah. how, like, how do you even sleep at night? Right. Without being, you know, so pilled up or boozed up. You know, it's just crazy. You know, like, that's Goodfellas, right? Joe Pesci, where he's real off the rails, or is that Casino? Both of both them. Both of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wonder if both of those were based off Roy DeMeo. I actually tried looking it up. No, well, the Goodfellas, it's based off of an actual... Um, character i can't speak for casino goodfellas he's actually based off someone it's not roy DeMeo. casino though. is too is that it's yeah. it's but i didn't know if his character was based off an actual person i think I it is it's those is. guys that the, the chicago outfit had running vegas back in the 70s yeah i think yeah. so it's i can't specific remember person. the actual name i'm gonna look it up while you're talking well, goodfellas was tommy like i think that was the actual but it, kid's but it was tommy um it wasn't the name in the movie no the last yeah. the surname was different yeah and Incidentally, Paul Castellano was the guy that John Gotti had shot and killed out in front of Spark Steakhouse in the 80s in Manhattan. That's when Gotti took over the Gambino crime family. That stuff is super interesting. Oh, yeah. It's very interesting. I used to know all about it. I used to read a lot about that. It's funny. We were talking about earlier with the thing in South Carolina. I remember reading a story where the same kind of incident, Paul Castellano's driver they were out driving somewhere in public and some kids like cut them off or something or they, and they, the kids like flipped them off. So he had his guys grab these guys and bring them back to his house. And he gave them a stern lecturing to like, you know who I am. And the kids were <laughs> shit in their pants and he didn't kill them. He let them go, but just, that uh, would be super scary. Kind of a, yeah. Like the Gambino crime boss brings you back to the house and gives you a stern talking to, cause you flipped them off or cut them <laughs> off in, in, in public. It's fucking terrifying. Tommy D Simone. It's the real name. Okay. What's the guy's name at Casino? Because that was the same thing. That was a real deal. You guys like they, they, they disappeared those here. guys in that Indiana cornfield. Like right. that wasn't made up from what I remember. Nikki Santoro uh, was him in the movie. In real life. Can we do the crime junkie bit where you send us the... <laughs> oh, Ashley. Yeah, I see what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah. Anthony Spilatoro, okay. maybe. Tony the Ant. Or is that the brother? Something like that, though. But, yeah, I think that was all based on actual events. Yeah. Well, I knew, uh, yeah, because f- was it Frank Rosenthal? I knew that uh, De Niro's character was based off of a true story in Casino. Well, his real name was Jimmy Conway, I believe, yeah. In, in Casino. Or Casino. Oh, it's Casino. It Con- wasn't Conway. It was Jimmy something. But it wasn't actually Conway. It was the name of Conway? Right. No. Anyways, go ahead. I don't know. Like live research on the show. Right. <laughs> Oh yeah, Ashley. I see. I th- yeah, <laughs> I see what you mean. Hey, at least we're we're giving it to him. Uh, it was Jimmy Burke was his real name. Jimmy Burke, yeah. the gentleman Jimmy. Jimmy Burke. the gent. That's right. The other thing that was going off the rails a bit was DeMeo's process of disposing bodies. He was getting sloppy, so using DeMeo as inspiration, Richards started looking for cleaner ways to kill, and that's when he found out about cyanide. If you remember from the HBO doc, they had that uh, that autopsy doctor on there. What's that guy's name? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he said, he's like, yeah, and someone found the brilliant idea that uh, <laughs> cyanide was undetectable unless you're really looking for it. So it was a genius way to kill people. <laughs> that, that guy was real like, enthused about it. The doctor's like, I'm not saying I would kill anyone, but if I was going to kill someone, I'd use cyanide. That is essentially what he said. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and he was very happy about that fact. Doctor, That's really fucking smart. <laughs> Dr. Richard McStuffin or something like that. It's that same guy. I can't remember his name. Dick McStuffin. Why don't you look it up that's for us? What I was saying. On, on air research. <laughs> no, that, that's all I got in me tonight. <laughs> I put the Oilers game back on now. 
Phil Salamene, the Cassia watch and, and porn industry guy, got Richard in contact with a pharmacist named Paul Hoffman. Phil had obviously killed someone with cyanide before because he showed Richard the exact amount to use to make it look like a heart attack and not go overboard where it clearly looks like murder. Dr. Michael Bodden. 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 Sounds made up to me. (laughs) So Richard was hired to kill a mid-level mob guy, but this guy was extremely paranoid and had bodyguards around him at all times. Like he got the hint that someone wanted him dead. Or he was just a good mobster. He was like, (laughs) nope, 24 seven, let's fucking go. (laughs) You have to, right? (laughs) Dude. But imagine that, like you feel so protected in that family and so untouchable that you do sleep and you do feel safe and you go out. It's crazy. I can't even wrap my head around that yeah. lifestyle. Nor could I. I think, yeah, like you said, protected. I think it's the under, like the undercard guys, like the people that are part, the guys are part of Roy DeMeo's crew. Like I couldn't be, imagine being a soldier for, for Roy DeMeo. Right, that's it's, the scary part. Yeah, like especially at this point, at this point he was getting to the point where if you just said something wrong and he pulled out that Uzi, it might be a joke or you just might fucking die right there. Hey, Tommy, why don't you go fuck yourself? Remember <laughs> with a spider? <laughs> he mouths off to, uh, have you seen, you've seen Goodfellas. Yeah. When uh, the, the, the little dudes bring in their drinks when they're playing cards yeah. and he forgets to bring uh, Tommy his drink and Tommy gives him the bullshit and he goes, Tommy, go fuck yourself. And Or was it? Yeah. No, the first time he didn't hear him, he said. Yeah. And so Pesci shoots him. And then after <laughs> the he foot. shoots him, the next scene is yeah. Tommy, why don't you go fuck yourself? Yeah. And they're all getting on, on Pesci about it. And he just fucking pulls up the gun and shoots him in the chest. It was uh, Christopher from The Sopranos. Yeah. De Niro's like, I'm not helping you bury the fucking body. Yeah. I'm not digging a hole. That's what they get pissed about. Like, I'm not, you're doing this on your fucking hole up. yourself. <laughs> oh, dig a hole. What is the first time I ever dug a hole before? <laughs> first time he shoots him in the foot. He's like, what do you want from him? Good shot. <laughs> But point taken, though, but I mean, history also shows that the boss can get hit, too. I mean, we just talked about Castellano getting gunned yeah. down on East 46th Street in Manhattan. So they're not immune by any means. Yep. I believe you mean Constellation, and it's the stars in the sky. <laughs> I don't know what Castellanos are, but. Hey, you're an astrono- astrology yeah, you're talking- guy. <laughs> are, you, are you an astronomy guy or an astrology guy? No, it's guy? astrology, pal. <laughs> I don't want to accuse you of any science when you're just uh, <laughs> reading your horoscope every yeah, morning. Just trying to get some horoscopes here. <laughs> so those bodyguards were around him at all times, except for when he was dancing on the disco dance floor. Richard said he went to the disco, sat back, and kind of people watched. Going back to part one, Richard made sure to point out over and over again that he had nothing against the gay community when he was preying on those guys to kill for uh, murder victims. And he did it a ton with this story, too. Richard said he couldn't figure out a way how to get close enough to this guy because he would be noticed on the dance floor. He's over six feet tall, 300 pounds. Through that people watching, Richard said no one paid any attention to gay guys. People didn't even look at them besides other gay guys. I don't think that's accurate. That's just how Richard... Sure, he didn't look at them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Richard figured he needed to make people think he was gay so no one would pay attention to him. According to Richard, the problem was that there was no such thing as a regular looking 300 pound gay man. Like the way he talks about it's like, that doesn't even exist for a big guy to be gay. Hmm. So according to him, he had to get creative. Richard got a pink and yellow suit. So not not just one solid color. He had a yellow vest, pink pants, um, a big red hat, and some platform shoes. And he got on the dance floor acting in Richard's words as quote, swishy. This guy swishy. Get out of here. <laughs> 300 pound dude, six foot, whatever. Just walking up there looking like a fucking traffic signal. You know, when in the old Bugs Bunny cartoons where he puts on a woman's dress and like the big hat and stuff and tries to, I'm pretty, yes. I'm pretty confident that that's where Richard got this idea. <laughs> That makes complete sense. <laughs> so as Richard's dancing around on the on the dance floor, in his pocket he had a syringe full of cyanide, and all he did was bump into his target on the dance floor, and a couple minutes later, this guy was dead, and they thought it was a heart attack. Mm. 
This sounds like a prison fantasy that he, uh, I don't know. They're definitely getting. I don't know. A I'm not sure I buy it as we go. Here. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's 100 percent true. I don't know. Yeah, there's no way to tell. Yeah, he just he really enjoyed this story in the documentary. He had a great time telling this story. <laughs> I guess I just try to put myself in prison in that situation. I get you know offered an HBO documentary like I'm you, telling tall tales right. too, right? You want to have that second HBO documentary right. and that third one and that fourth one, unless all my tall tales are really what happened. So I, I don't know. Yeah. At this point in the story, Robert Prange shows up and he's kind of like a mentor to Richard regarding ideas to use cyanide and ways to dispose of bodies. According to Richard, he was scouting out a hotel for a hit he was working on when he got into the elevator with what he called, quote, a little guy with bushy eyebrows. Richard said that he got hitman vibes. He specifically said, quote, hitman vibes from this guy, but he ignored it. A couple hours later, they ran into each other again. This time it was in the hotel bathroom. They started a conversation and it kind of sounded like a who's on first type thing. They were going back and forth trying to figure out if they were there to kill each other or who they were supposed to kill. And finally they figured out they were both there to kill different people, said good luck and went on their way. Really? Really? I want this one to be true. (laughs) It sounds like a John Wick conversation at the Continental Hotel with somebody. The weird thing with Robert Prange is pretty much everything that is known about Robert Prange is from Richard Kuklinski. Mm -hmm. But Robert Prange was a real guy. And we'll talk about it at the end. There's some weird spelling out there with how this stuff is reported. Mm -hmm. And I think it's done that way with some of these guys. Even some of the other names that we're going to bring up i think they just purposely had their names misspelled to avoid things and cover their trail yeah so we don't know much about so, robert prange but he did exist doesn't it suck if robert prange actually did exist and was really fucking good at his job and then fucking kuklinski is the one who just outs all this shit <laughs> because of a stupid hotel <laughs> meeting like prange is like cafe motherfucker like <laughs> Like, is there a hitman code word that you're dancing around each other and eventually you're like, oh, no, I'm here to kill like, someone else. I picture them like, oh, all right. in a small little room circling each other, like with their hands right. ready to like draw a right. gun or something. Right. This story's wild. That man. could be a hilarious scene in a movie, by the way. Somebody should write that. We should work that into one of our movies that we've thought of over the years. Yeah. Like maybe the movie where Teddy Roosevelt bangs Hermione or something. <laughs> is that a bonus show? I think so. All right. Well, if there was ever a reason to get on Patreon, we're going to leave it at that. <laughs> Rough riders. <laughs> In your half muggle punani. <laughs> yeah, or we're... full muggle punani. <laughs> Stop. We're giving too much away. <laughs> Patreon.com slash Necronomapod. I couldn't even tell you what episode that was. Yeah, I don't, I don't know either. But it exists. It's there. <laughs> oh, it is there. You could... I, I was convinced that night we had won an Academy Award. Based off of that that screenplay you oh, came up with. Sure. Come on. Better than Forrest Gump. <laughs> we're gonna get <laughs> we're gonna get Christian Bale to play uh Teddy Roosevelt too, because he'll go straight <laughs> method, it'll be perfect. <laughs> so a few days later, Richard was sitting in a van at this hotel, still scouting it out, when a Mr. Softy ice cream truck came by. Richard thought to himself that ice cream sounded good, so he gets out of the van, walks over to get in line with kids, and in full Mr. Softy uniform is Robert Prange. Come on! (laughs) At this point, Richard and Prange hit it off. Prange told Richard all about the Mr. Softy truck. It was like his undercover disguise to go scout locations and follow people, and Richard thought that was the most genius stuff ever. He loved everything about this Mr. Softy (laughs) truck. I mean, it kind of is when you think about it. Along with teaching Richard more effective ways to use cyanide, Prange gave Richard the idea of freezing a body to throw off the time of death. Richard only did this once, but this is what got Richard the nickname Iceman. In 1981, Richard tried this, tried this out on a guy named Louis Masge. Masge was involved in the porn film business, mainly the distribution of blank videotapes. In the early 80s, blank videotapes were a hot item, and Masgay really wanted to get his hands on another shipment. He kept bothering Richard about when the shipment was going to be ready, and this annoyed Richard enough that he decided Masgay needed to go. That's like SD card people being involved in the podcast industry, because that's what we record on. 
Like, are you really in the porn industry if you're <laughs> selling blank videotapes? <laughs> are we going to talk more about Prange at the end here? Yeah, yeah. We're, okay. We'll circle back to Prange. So, I, I just wasn't sure if that was left open-ended because I think that's an interesting story. He's a fun little character. Yeah. Yeah, we'll circle back because there's, there's, um, there's some corroboration with Prange. Yeah. With the Mr. Softy thing. And yeah, 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 right. Speaking of the nickname Iceman, do you know who else had a name similar to that? Who's that? that? Mr. Freeze from Batman. <laughs> Is that Schwarzenegger? I believe so, yeah. yeah. It's Sub-Zero from Mortal Kombat. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now we're talking. Thank you. There's so many cool like temperature-based characters out there. The movie Frozen. Like the Disney movie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what popped in my head. <laughs> Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> so Richard told Masge to meet him at a diner to pick up the tapes and pay for them. Masge showed up with $95,000, but there were no tapes. Richard shot him in the head and then took Masge back to a warehouse spot Richard was renting near Prange's Mr. Softy storage spot. Richard put Masge's body in a freezer and let him sit there until 1983. And Richard rented this uh, storage spot specifically because Prange's Mr. Softy thing was there. Mm. They would hang out together in their storage units and talk about different ways to kill people. Prange was real into um, kind of like a mercenary type guy. That's the way Richard described him, like mm. a go rogue kind of had a bunch of grenades and shit. <laughs> Can I ask how many blank videotapes do you get for ninety five thousand dollars? <laughs> It seems like that might be like a hundred pallets of blank videotapes. How much were they when they first came I, out? I, I'm trying. I sat here trying to think about that today. And I, I really don't remember when I saw $95,000. I'm like, so blank videotapes were really expensive back in the day. I guess. I mean, were they not the way they were selling them for so much? Like what year are we in here? 1981. Yeah. This would have been 81 early eighties. Like that's probably around the time we got our first vhs player i just i don't remember how much blank tapes cost i guess they probably were pretty expensive Ninety five thousand still seems like a lot <laughs> does, but i mean right? i guess if you're making if you're in the business and you're making porn you but want they, a bunch of tapes but they were available like i like i just don't understand this 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 business or maybe this was at a a discounted price like they were stolen maybe like a yeah. truck hijacking or something yeah i'm trying to find out why you need to buy these undercover like this he must know. have been getting them at a discount, or at least thinking he did, because there were, were no tapes. Mm. Interesting. On September 25th, 1983, Masgay's body was found in a park in Orangetown, New York, with a bullet hole to the back of his head. Richard didn't thaw out the body before he dumped it. He also wrapped it in plastic garbage bags, which kept it insulated and partially frozen. The medical examiner found ice crystals inside the body, because it was on a warm September day. If the body had thought out before it was found, the medical examiner said he probably never would have noticed the fact that Richard had killed Masgay two years earlier. So it's a good plan. It would have worked out. Yeah. If he left a little bit longer. The downfall of Richard started with a guy named George Maliband. Richard considered Maliband a friend, and Maliband was into all that blank videotape stuff that Masgay was into. How can you be into <laughs> blank videotape? It's a hot commodity, I guess. It's so weird. You know, I'm going to be honest. When I was reading these notes, <laughs> like I actually Googled what blank videotape was because I thought it was like a section of porn that I didn't know like about. <laughs> because I was like, well, there, there must be something to this. Like, and then I was like, no, this is literally yeah. just blank tapes. Like, that's some good yeah. snow on that tape. Yeah, like I didn't know what that meant. Like I was like, does this mean like a certain like category of the porn community that like mm. I'm not aware of? And I, mm. I was like, oh, okay. At the risk of Mike saying that I've already talked about this before. <laughs> if we if we look back to the early days of, of uh, home VCRs, the Betamax from Sony was a better quality product, but... VHS won out because of the porn industry and how they decided to use the VHS format for their home home we did, videos. We did talk about that before. I think we probably talked about it at some point. specific story. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So maybe this was in those kind of days right before VHS beat out beta and were tapes more expensive. I, I don't know. 
The it was an interesting horn had a stranglehold I'd f- on the videotape yeah. market. Yeah. Back in the day, WWE signed with Coliseum Video because their market, their other end of their market was in porn. And they became like, you know, they they were the better option for them. Well, it's hard to imagine now when you can, you know, take your phone out and look at every porn video in the history of of the world. But before you'd have to go to you know, so I could find theaters, Heimlich and Hitler <laughs> or whatever video you watched. I mean, if you're a dark web connoisseur, I'm oh. sure you. Well, can I'm find out. That. Yeah, like what was it? Going to theaters and then like weird shit. Like remember Gacy used to have like parties where guys would they would all watch porn yeah, together or like the old reel to reels. But how you know how practical is carrying around reel to reel stuff? But that's another really weird fucking yeah. But can you imagine the weird old days of having to go crank one out at an adult theater? You know, like Pee Wee Herman got arrested, right? For, <laughs> yeah. Is it an adult theater? Yeah, but he also got arrested out? like in the day of the internet, right? Oh, true. Like he, he, has, he, he, did he, not, he did not tap. There was a nostalgia <laughs> piece going on there, I guess. But yeah, yeah. like pre, you know, pre or like, pre late seventies, pre early eighties, yeah. when you actually had to go watch porn at a movie theater. Like that's horrible. Who the fuck wants to do that? No, at that point, just use your imagination, pal. Stay yeah. at home, use your imagination. It's just a completely different world. Those places, or be a normal, would be person. up there with uh, apartment wrestling. Adult movie theaters. You not hate great. Wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're king shaming people a little bit on that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't go to one of those theaters, I don't think. But I also grew up in the like you know the age of the internet, so yeah. the fuck do I know? Just be weird. It would be odd because then then it's also odd if you're there and you're not cranking. Like right. what the fuck are you doing right. here? Like you just pop, hanging like, out, just eat, <laughs> eating like a Mister Good Bar. Like we're just watching somebody get banged out. Like, like, I like the, uh, the, the <laughs> cinematography is just so yeah. great. I'm a fan of the cinematographer. I love the storyline on this one. <laughs> I'm here for the music. <laughs> How many people are allowed in one of those theaters before it gets weird? Yeah, like a uh, Two. Two. When you're at two, it's weird. Like, how many people in each row? Like, what's the spacing look like? Yeah. You go in and you're sitting by yourself. The guy comes and sits right next right. to you. Right. Right. You jerk each other off. Like, is it better? Like, two the, left-handers? Then you're like the guy in the documentary shrugging his shoulders. <laughs> From, uh, uh, <laughs> God damn, what's the name of that documentary? The Old Man. We Yeah, uh, I don't know. And abducted in plain sight. <laughs> R.I.P. to that man, by the way. He has since passed away. The dad. Yeah, sad. It's still a fantastic photo. <laughs> I think I use it at least once a day in our text thread. I sent that to another group of my friends one time, and they're like, "What? What is this?" What is, <laughs> what you guys haven't seen that? You asshole! <laughs> in the place. This is the face you make when you jerk off your friend because he asked you to, or you let after your, he bangs your wife, yeah, after he bangs your wife <laughs> and abducts your daughter, or you let your child's rapist, you know, take her on vacation again. <laughs> Oops! <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Got me again. <laughs> Fool me once. It just works so many ways. It says so much. Anyway, it's good to be living in modern times, I think, is the. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> so Maliban was into the, the blank VHS tape business and Richard helped him out throughout their friendship. Uh, but Maliban got into some shit with Roy DeMeo and Richard wasn't going to get involved in that. While they were driving around and debating this issue about DeMeo, Maliban tried to like low key threaten Richard into helping him solve this thing with DeMeo. Maliban was like, I would help you out. Like, if it was me, I would help you out with DeMeo because I know where your wife and kids live and I wouldn't let DeMeo do anything when, you know, I know where your family lives. And as soon as Maliban mentioned Barbara and the kids, Richard pulled off to the side of the road. And shot Maliban five times in the head. Yeah, smart move, Maliban. He didn't think that out very well. No. Uh-uh. Richard talked about this um, in disposing him. We're going to talk about that. But that because it was like such a knee jerk reaction and it was inside the car like that, he said he couldn't hear for hours because it was so close. Mm. Like his eyes were all fucked up from the flash of the gun and his ears were ringing. He said for... I don't know if he said like a day or whatever, but he like couldn't hear very well. He doesn't well. normally operate like that. He's always got a plan, well thought out. Yeah. He let his temper get the best of him in this situation here. 
Yeah, he did say that this was one that he didn't feel like he had complete control yeah. because he was disoriented from right. the gun. So do you guys tend to believe these ones more than when he's not elaborating on all the torture and kind of glorifying it? Yeah, or when he admits he wasn't, you know, he wasn't perfectly he wasn't executed. At his best. Yeah, I think that's right. And like the, these guys were talking about like this whole row of people, these murders, these were a lot of these guys were found, you know, so he definitely killed people, but like you can corroborate. Yeah. His story of the event. Yeah. Some of that crazy shit though. Like you guys were saying, who knows? Mm -hmm. Richard didn't have a plan. Like we were just talking about and Maliban was a really big guy between 250 and 300 pounds. So what Richard did was cut the tendons in Maliban's legs to get them to fit into a 55-gallon drum. Richard then dumped the drum barrel behind the Chemitex chemical plant in Jersey City, but in a half-assed way because Maliban's legs ended up falling out of the barrel. When the body was found, Maliban's brother told police that Maliban was last known to have been with Richard, and that was to buy $27,000 worth of blank videotapes. So now... Richard was on law enforcement's radar. You got my videotapes? I <laughs> suck a dick. Like, why didn't he go freeze this guy? Right? It almost seemed like he was getting a little tired. Okay. We're just doing, like, the best hits or the greatest hits and, like, really condensing the story. But throughout the book, it's, it kind of sounds like by this time he's just getting a little worn out with... With just being perfect. How like can that it. life not take an enormous toll on you? Like sitting in a room with I, I Roy DeMeo right. with an Uzi loaded. At, like it has to. I would have broke a long time before this. Right. You know, I mean, in all in all, I think it's like from the point where he committed his first murder to last, it's 30 years of killing. It's a lot. After this murder, Richard hired a group of guys to do breaking and entering jobs. This was Percy House, Daniel Deppner, Gary Smith, and Al Rinke. Percy House went into business for himself and decided that he was going to rob Phil Salomene. Remember, Phil Salomene got him hooked up with cyanide in the first place. In order to not get himself killed, Phil Salomene started telling Percy everything he knew about what Richard was up to. He told Percy about the murder of Maliban and how Richard had frozen Masgay's body. In September 1982, Percy was arrested and agreed to flip on Richard and was placed in protective custody. Warrants were also issued for the arrest of Gary Smith and Daniel Deppner because Percy started talking, he flipped on everybody. Richard told them to lay low and rented them a room at the York Motel in North Bergen, New Jersey. Gary Smith left the hotel to visit his daughter, which made Richard think that Gary might become an informant. According to Daniel Deppner's wife, Barbara Deppner, Richard, Daniel, and Percy decided that Gary had to go since he skipped out to go see his daughter. Richard fed Gary a burger laced with cyanide, but when this was working, it wasn't working fast enough, Daniel Deppner strangled Gary with a lamp cord. Richard and Daniel put Gary's body in between the mattress and box spring. Over the next four days, multiple people who rented that room complained about a bad smell but no one bothered to look under the bed. Finally, on that fifth day, the motel manager looked under the bed and found Gary's body. <laughs> so when you say that, you know, like Richard and Percy were in on this, that Gary had to go because he went to visit his daughter, Richard was not aware that Percy had flipped on him and went into business for himself and was getting information from, from Phil? <clears throat> yeah, so when, when Percy got arrested stuff started to go kind of like in a oh shit mode for Richard trying to clean all this up. And he had been talking to everybody like Phil Solomon. knew all that shit about um, freezing Masgay's body. Mm. Maliban being put in that drum. He had kind of a big mouth. It seems. Yeah. Towards the end here, he was getting real loose with what he was saying. Like almost just too comfortable or wanting to get caught. Like he was done or wanting to, I guess. No more fucks to give kind of deal. After Gary's murder, Richard moved Daniel Deppner into an apartment that belonged to Rich Patterson, who was the then fiance of Richard's daughter, Merrick. Patterson was away at the time, but Richard had keys to the apartment. Somewhere between February and May 1983, 
Deppner was killed by Richard using a cyanide laced roast beef sandwich in a single gunshot to the head. The cyanide's not working real good. Or he's uh first guy cyanide he gave him he had the strangle and it wasn't working so fast, and he gave him the roast beef wasn't working so fast, so I had to shoot him. Yeah. I don't know if he wasn't giving them enough or, yeah, right. or what. Probably got him that giant roast beef sandwich from Arby's. <laughs> put enough cyanide, right? It's like a half pound of roast beef. All that food. It's going to take a while yeah. to soak Plus in. Plus those right? curly fries and Arby sauce and horsey sauce. That large diet Dr. Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it'll kill you slowly with that heart attack you're going to get from all that. But I don't think that's how he wasn't going for the long game on that one. <laughs> Richard got Patterson's help to dispose of Daniel's body, telling Patterson that Deppner was a friend in trouble with law enforcement and someone had broken in and killed him over the weekend. Daniel Deppner's body was found on May 14th, 1983, after a guy was riding his bike through a park and saw his body surrounded by vultures. So we got his future son-in-law involved in all this. Right. Mm. At this point, it was like time to clean house for Richard. Next on his list was the pharmacist that supplied the cyanide, Paul Hoffman. Richard told Hoffman about a shipment of a new ulcer medication called Tagamet, and this would be very profitable for Hoffman. There was no shipment of Tagamet, and when Hoffman showed up, Richard tried to shoot him, but the gun jammed, so instead he beat Hoffman to death with a tire iron. Richard said he then stuffed the body into a 55-gallon drum and left it outside of a motel. One day, Richard noticed that the drum had disappeared, but never found out what happened to it, and Hoffman's body was never found. Now, that motel was next to a place where Richard liked to eat. It was like a deli, and he said that for this whole time, he would go get a sandwich and sit on that drum and eat. Just go sit on this dude's (laughs) body. And then one day, he went to get a sandwich, and it was gone. Like, ah, I guess they moved it. (laughs) Goddamn. After Hoffman's murder... Richard said that he set his eyes on Roy DeMeo. And this has to be taken with a grain of salt. And even the author, um, Phil Carlo, who wrote the book that I've been uh, reading about this, he said that this is, in his opinion, this is not true. Um, Roy DeMeo spent the early 80s just fucking up over and over again, being high on cocaine and just pretty much off the rails, just complete lunatic. According to Richard, there were rumors that the mayo was going to flip because he kept getting arrested. And Richard saw this as a chance to get revenge for that beating that the mayo gave him in the 70s. From what I read, he was getting so paranoid that he was even thinking of faking his own death to get away. Like he was going to have his son shoot him and all kinds of crazy plans. Right. Reading, yeah. And then um, and then he went to dinner with with his crew and was never seen again. When he's when his body turned up, he was frozen. So that that's where you get a little bit of. Well, they find him in a bat in the trunk of his Cadillac or something like that. Yeah, and his body was partially frozen. But they don't know what happened, and Kuklinski never took credit. Oh, he took credit. He did take credit. Oh, okay. But most people don't believe. They believe his own crew killed him. Yeah, like who, mob experts don't believe Kuklinski had anything to do with it. Most people have a lot of questions if. Richard had much of anything to do with mob people the way that he says he did. Right. The defense I've seen for that is that because Richard was Polish, they never let him in like that to where he would even be on the FBI's radar or anything like that. He never went to any of their, their gatherings or, you know, any social event. He didn't, they would have kept a huge buffer from him. They wouldn't have let him into that inner circle. Like he claims. That's what people say. They're like, yeah, he was paid to kill multiple people, but. But he wouldn't have that inside knowledge that he claims. And that's why he was never on the radar of the FBI or anything. There's no files, you know, Mm. until this shit starts hitting the fan here. Um, That that was the that was the main defense, too, with, with Roy DeMeo was that the FBI was writing down license plates and stuff for. Uh, people that were hanging out with him and Richard never hung out with them. New Jersey law enforcement had been keeping an eye on Richard, specifically an officer named Pat Kane. Kane had an informant tell him about a breaking and entering gang that was gradually going missing. And they were all connected to a guy he only knew as big Richie. Eventually a joint task force with the police ATF and FBI was started called operation Iceman. 
and that's from the body that was found frozen. And they put special agent Dominic Polifrone undercover for 18 months to arrest Richard. Starting in 1985, Kane and Profilone worked with Phil Solomene to get Profilone close to Richard. Posing as a mob-connected guy named Dominic Provenzano, Profilone bought a silence gun from Richard. In recordings, Richard talked about a body he kept in a freezer for two and a half years. He told Profilone he liked killing with poison, saying, quote, why be messy when you can do it nice and calm? He asked Profilone if he could supply him with pure cyanide. Profilone told Richard that he wanted to hire him to murder a cocaine dealer and recorded Richard going into detail about how he would do it. Richard was also recorded bragging about how he killed a man by putting cyanide on his burger and his plan to kill, quote, a couple of rats, meaning Barbara Deppner and Percy House. That's stone cold, man. It's crazy. It's quite a stunner. On December 17th, 1986, Richard met Paul Frone to get cyanide for a planned murder, which was going to be an attempt on an undercover police officer. After the recorded conversation with Paul Frone, Richard went for a walk. He tested the cyanide on a stray dog and got suspicious when he realized that it wasn't real. Two hours later, while Richard was driving with his wife, Law enforcement stopped, and he was arrested. Trying on a stray dog. Yeah, he said that the dog just, uh, just was walked away. Mm-hmm. It's like, fuck out of here, pal. <laughs> but the, the way that Richard tells it, too, is like he got a little suspicious about it, but in the book, he's quoted as um, calling Profron, um a jive-ass blowhard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he said he was a jive-ass blowhard that sold okay. them that didn't know what cyanide really was. P.S. Big fan of the term blowhard. <laughs> Love that one. <laughs> so he just went home afterwards. He was like, uh, the, eh, guy doesn't, it. the guy doesn't know what he's selling. All right. Lucky for the profilone. Prolifone. <laughs> Pro- <laughs> hard word to say, man. Man, he'd be fun to watch at Subway, wouldn't he? Dave's like, give me some of that profilone on that turkey. <laughs> give me that prola, prola, the pepper jack. <laughs> Swiss. <laughs> no, they don't have fucking Swiss at uh, Subway. They don't, no. I ask every time I go just to see if they updated their cheese orders. I bet they love that. Yeah, well, <laughs> they don't because none of them stay open long enough for me to be a repeat customer around these parts. The trials went on forever, but ultimately Richard got 60 years for some of his crimes and then two life sentences for murder. In October 2005, almost 18 years of being in prison, Richard was diagnosed with Kawasaki disease, which is an inflammation of the blood vessels. Oh, I thought that was just for guys <laughs> who drove shitty motorcycles. <laughs> Not Harley guys like you, right, Mike? Of course. <laughs> he was transferred to St. Francis Medical Center in Trenton, New Jersey. He asked doctors to make sure that they revived him if he had a heart attack or something, but Barbara had signed a do not resuscitate order. A week before his death, the hospital called Barbara to try and get her to change her mind on that, but she said no. Why did she get to say that? I guess she was very the last, strange. I don't know. If she's just the last person. Like it was never mm. transferred. I don't know. I don't know what He's the like, rule. Yeah, please save me. She's like, eh, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't understand eh. if he can still talk and speak with doctors. They're like, well, no, no, you're laying in a bed. Clearly, oh. we can't listen to you. That's... Dave, can you send that power over to Ian and I for you? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, gosh, I just broke my finger. <laughs> nope, put him down. Put him down. He's out. Very rude. <laughs> Says the guy who's twice on this show, want to throw my face into a wall. <laughs> Richard died on March 5th, 2006 at 70 years old from a heart attack. And this is where his death gets really interesting. In 2001, Richard did the third HBO documentary and he confessed to killing New York police officer, Peter Calabro who was ambushed and shot by an unknown gunman on March 14, 1980. Calabro was rumored to have mob connections and was investigated for selling confident fuck and was investigated for selling confidential information to the Gambino family. His wife, Carmela drowned under mysterious circumstances three years earlier and members of her family believed that Calabro was responsible. I believe it's pronounced kohlrabi. It's a root vegetable. <laughs> It's delicious. 
It is. It is delicious. <laughs> we, we all love kohlrabi. <laughs> what is it? I brought it over to your house the one time. Remember, it's that like the root vegetable. It's almost like a radish. Oh yeah, it is but real it's good. Not, like spice. My mom grows it in her garden. And it's fantastic. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, it's yeah. good. Fucking deer eat it though all the time. <laughs> I never get any, and I'm about to fucking go whoop some deer ass. Get your mom a, a rifle to sit out in her backyard and shoot those deer so they don't get the kohlrabi. I don't think so, pal. <laughs> Maybe I'll go do it. I'll go sit out there. You know, as an outdoorsman. Okay. At the time, his murder was thought by law enforcement to be revenge, either carried out or arranged by Carmela's relatives. Her brothers were regarded as, quote, key suspects, but the crime stayed cold. In February 2003, Richard was charged with Calabro's murder and received another sentence of 30 years. Describing the murder, Richard said he parked his van on the side of a narrow road, forcing other drivers to slow pass. He laid in a snowbank behind his van until Calabro came by at 2 a.m. Then Richard stepped out and shot him in the head with a sawed-off shotgun. I don't suspect there was much left of his head then. Uh, No, Richard described it as being the same thing when you see a pumpkin explode. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, my God. (laughs) That sounds about right. Richard said that he was paid to kill Calabro by Gambino crime family soldier Sammy the Bull Gravano, and Gravano provided the murder weapon. Gravano, who was serving a 20-year sentence in Arizona for drugs, was also indicted for the murder, and Richard was set to testify against him. Gravano said he wasn't involved in Calabro's death and said no to a plea deal where he would receive no additional jail time if he confessed to the murder and flipped on all of his accomplices. The charges against Gravano were dropped after Richard's death in 2006, and there are a lot of credible people that believe Gravano had Richard poisoned using cyanide. Wow. How about that? So Sammy Gravano was John Gotti's underboss who turned state's witness and testified against Gotti help convict him and then went into witness protection and then once he was out of witness protection he got busted <laughs> in the drug ring and did 20 years in arizona how does one get out of witness protection he left or because he's free he, to leave yeah. he chose to leave and then got fucked fucked up again yeah. was it like an ecstasy ring or something i don't remember but i, I yeah yeah yeah, Gravano's the one who put Gotti away. Well, you don't want to be stuck away. in fucking Tucson, Arizona, eating egg noodles with ketchup, right? Like fucking the end of Goodfellas. <laughs> That's right. Wherever he was. I don't know where he was. It looked but, like Tucson, right? Yeah. No, it looked like Nebraska or something, right? It was just some random yeah. building a community. I am 100% going to go home tonight and watch Goodfellas. <laughs> <laughs> or your favorite least, movie, Or at right? least a little bit of it before I fall asleep. Yeah, oh, it's hands down my favorite movie of all time. So that's a crazy way to go, perhaps. Yeah. There were, um, from what I was reading, a lot of people were not happy that he did those HBO documentaries. Because they, I, they just thought it, you know. There were a lot of people that were still. Celebrated his life and kind of made him look like a hero or just. No, like a lot of guys that still were doing some mob stuff, some organized crime, were not thrilled with. That he was still kind of attached to or. or just all the things that he talked about. Oh. In the book, I'm sure. In the documentaries, they were not happy with some of that stuff's even going on today, right? Like it's still happening. Yeah, they're still sure. currently a boss of um, the Ga- uh, the Gambino family, correct? Right. There's bosses of all the families who we yeah. all respect very much, and we don't accuse them of anything. Absolutely not, not in the slightest. I like having my fingernails attached to my hand. <laughs> It's none of our business what honest men do when they're plying their <laughs> trade, and I have no qualms with any of it. Look, we're just telling the story of Richard Kuklinski. I don't believe he was involved in, with the mob in any way. I think he told lies about a bunch of people he didn't know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think he should apologize for it, if he could. From the grave. <laughs> if, in fact, he was a liar liar, did the Iceman die because his pants were on fire? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking the tough questions here, pal. It's ridiculous. (laughs) What's the deal with with Richard's brother? He was another airplane peanuts. (laughs) What's the deal with airplane peanuts? Uh, Richard's brother. Sorry. There there seemed to be uh, something in the genes. There always is. (laughs) With uh, the Kuklinski family because his brother um, ended up raping a 12-year-old girl, and then uh, 
strangled her to death. Oh my goodness. And then threw her, just threw her body off the top of a five story building. Mm. And he killed her dog as well. Um, so he was sent to jail for life, obviously. And coincidentally him and Richard were in the same prison together. Mm. They would pass each other every once in a while. Wow. Interesting. Richard said he didn't want anything to do with him. Really? He Really? Yeah. He said he would nod to him sometimes. Like up, say, bro? Yeah, pass him by and sometimes his brother wouldn't even respond to him mm. he was like that's it we don't talk i don't i don't care to talk to him i'll say hi if i'm passing that's fucking wild man sick <clears throat> so that's the ice man mm. it's very interesting i would recommend anybody uh that's like really interested to go deeper to read the mm-hmm. the book by phil court Ian, I got that book two weeks ago in anticipation of the show, and I read exactly no pages from that book. <laughs> Good so job. thank you for supplying me with all that information. Any, anytime Dave thought about reading the book, he fell asleep. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> you bought the book. You gave it an honest effort, right? What else What else can you ex- be expected to do? I think he got my copy because I bought it the same time. <laughs> and he got his the same day I was supposed to get mine, but mine was delayed. So I just cancel. I'm like, fuck this. I'm just going to read it on my laptop. Your Amazon skills suck, pal. He could have just handed it to you at that point. Yeah, I didn't use it. He could have had it. He wasn't going to read it. (laughs) (laughs) You want him to sign it and give it to you? (laughs) The scary thing is that there there are people like that in the world, you know? And there still are. There always will be. And don't flip people off in traffic because you never know who's going to shoot you. Especially now. That's it. Do your best to get Spoiler by. Spoiler alert. If if they're driving a truck and they have a set of like fake balls hanging off the back, they have a lot of guns in that vehicle. <laughs> Don't flip them off, probably. <laughs> Am I wrong? Uh, no. Okay. No, you're not. All right. Let's get to some uh, patron thanks. We have some shout outs for new patrons. John Straub, Elfie218, Michelle Taylor, Jana Steele, Ben Crane. Ian, please adopt me. Matt, Brittany Curland, Jackson M, Aaron Patterson, Corey L, Mitchell Phillips, Ligma Balsack, <laughs> Gray Haven, <laughs> Original Denzel, Kenzie Johnson, Bill Hickson, Jonah Sperry, Sarah Jones, Sarah Pierce, Wild Bill Humphrey, Grover, James Brown, Julia Christophel, Danielle Barr 15, Mest Sweats, Moo Cow 8, Joe Blumkenberg, Jane Christensen, Brianna, Desiree Wise, Nick, Cole and Ashley Frey, Frey or Free, Margot, Patricia Hackney, Amanda Rivers, Dion Pack, and Dave's Deviled Egg Dick. Sounds delicious. <laughs> I do Ex- like deviled eggs. Yeah. I do like deviled eggs. I don't know if I want it as your dick, but you know. Hey, don't knock it till you try it, though. Ian, what do you got? For iTunes, I have one for hashtag my opinion matters, Tan Man Slivy, Masked MILF, and Lydia757. Thank you for the awesome reviews. Masked MILF, huh? What's she up to at night? Um anything I write about this show just won't do it justice. That's true. <laughs> okay. Why? Like, why is, is that a kink? Well, mask milf? Why be all right? Like, why does she have a mask on? Oh, I don't know. Remember in Californication when Runkle meets the milf at the play place and he has to wear a mask <laughs> while she's sucking him off in the, the, the <laughs> stall bathroom stall. It's great. <laughs> Meanwhile, his kids in the play thing like stuck and needing his help. <laughs> like, I feel like mask milf's getting gang bang with her mask on. I don't know. She um, she joined Patreon. She said join their Patreon for even more good oh, stuff. Mask Milf is on Patreon. Thanks, Mask Milf. <laughs> <laughs> Some fucking 300 pound neck beard dude <laughs> sitting in his basement. Oh, my name is Mask Milf. I'm going to cornhole Mike when as soon as I get a chance to chloroform. Why has it got to be me? Maybe it was the fuck Ian. I don't know. Maybe once you're deviled egg dick, pal. Maybe. I don't know. What uh, What do you have, Dave? I don't have anything. Oh, okay. Yeah, That's yeah. how he says that. So, so I go. Mm. Did we give final thoughts on Richard Kuklinski? I mean, I thought we did. We kind of. What were you? If you have a final thought, pal, you go ahead. 
Do we think? It, what do we think on the debate of serial killer versus mass murderer? Mm. I don't know if I believe the homeless thing that he just massacred and preyed on homeless people like that. I think there's a lot of embellishment in those stories. Yeah, I don't know that yeah. you consider contract killers like that serial killers, but I don't know. They I, serially kill people. Is the fact that they do it for money make it? Different but I don't than know if, doing it but, for pleasure, but maybe. Mean, that's not the debate, though, right? Like, as opposed to, like, the mindset of a serial killer versus the mindset of a guy like this. Yeah, I mean, Isn't that what the debate is yeah, about, probably? It's an academic debate, for sure, right? He I mean, serially killed people. Because you wouldn't consider Joseph Mengele a serial killer. He's a mass murderer. Yeah. I do not think yeah. I would consider him a serial killer in the context that most serial killers are considered, considered serial killers. I think killers. that's right, yeah. yeah. And I also don't believe a lot of what he said. A lot of the the serial killers heart comes up with that whole, you know, walking up and down west side of Manhattan and killing homeless people. And I don't believe that. I believe he probably killed that first one. Yeah. By stabbing that guy in the chest for real. Maybe some, um, maybe others, but I don't think he just walked up and down, you know, Manhattan like that. Seems Kill- unlikely. Yeah. So I think we're all on the same page. Yeah, so in the traditional sense, I don't think he's a serial killer. But like you said, he serial killed people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's semantics. It's academic. I think he definitely killed a ton of a people. A lot of people, yeah. yeah. I don't think he killed Jimmy Hoffa. I, no. Not with that, no. I, que- <laughs> I question the involvement with the mafia. I, I'm not sure all that's on. He was hired to accurate. do a few things and blew it up to be a big, you know, he's connected. I think and that's possible, yeah. Kind of inflated his sense of self-worth within the mob. I think that might be true. I mean, he he was making a fuck ton of money. You know, I mean, his family. But that could have even been from a few kills, right? Like, Yeah, I mean, well, and then he had the, the porn business thing going on. But... It, they and those lived blank, a, and the blank tapes. <laughs> they lived a high end life, you know. And I mean, the mob was highly involved in the porn industry back in those days, so I don't doubt that he had contact. And I'm, I some think of those he people, had yeah, direct yeah. contact with Roy DeMeo. I think that's probably right, but I think he inflated his position in some of this stuff. In a lot of this, well, stuff. and does the media even inflate it though? Because like when you hear of him, he's like the the mafia hitman, right? Yeah, like that's what he's known as. Look, like HBO's not downplaying his role to get people <laughs> right. to watch it. You know? Right. Right. So, I mean, you know, like everything else, it's probably somewhere in the middle. Who knows? I don't know. Just like college mics, probably somewhere in the middle. <laughs> probably so. Maybe. <laughs> oh, I don't remember. It was a gray area for me. It's a gray I just area. go off the memoirs of all the, uh, the females. <laughs> they say it was a great time. I'm so. still waiting for them, uh, eyewitness accounts, to reach out to us. They'll get there. Okay. I'm blocking most of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just pr- protect the names and inquiries at necronompod.com. He doesn't have access to that mailbox. So, <laughs> sure. Wait to hear from him. I don't have access either. So. Wait to hear, wait to hear from him. <laughs> I, I purposely uh, limit myself to access of most of our accounts. <laughs> I don't need to see that shit. I don't even know what the login is for that one. <laughs> I believe it's Casey's Hot 6969. <laughs> it's not hard to figure out Dave's passwords. <laughs> So circling back to Prange, Mr. Softy, um, <laughs> eventually Richard got, uh, when he was cleaning house, you know, killing everybody off, he got weird vibes from Prange and did and ended up shooting him and mm. killing him. So they found him in his Mr. Softy truck, right? They did. There is a news report yeah, that yeah, they I found. That. Um, it doesn't go into a lot of detail. So if you want to say that Rod or that, um, that Richard was, you know, made up a lot of things. If he made up Prange, and remember we said like the spelling is weird with his mm-hmm. last name yeah. and stuff. If he made up Prange, he would have had to have known about this ice, this Mr. Softy guy that got killed all these years earlier and then brought it up in the HBO documentary. And then made up this whole story about running into him in a bathroom and right having that. Awkward moment. There's a lot of coincidences there. I, I think I read that Prange was on trial or out on bail or something for blowing up the door of his ex-wife and son's house. Yeah. At that time. Like and Richard said that they the fucked rail. around. Remember we said that they had that uh the storage unit next to each other. Mm-hmm. Um Richard said they fucked around with grenades a lot and stuff. <laughs> so what kind of background checks you think uh 
Mr. Frosty company is running. And guys who are like, hey, I want to drive your truck. <laughs> Softy, not Mr. Frosty. Uh, Softy, excuse me. <laughs> Mr. Softy. I didn't even make Mike one Mike in college joke with Mr. Softy. Well, it wouldn't have made any sense. <laughs> um, they're just like, oh, you want to drive around and be around kids all day? Yeah, you got the job. That's right. Like, I wonder if it's a franchise type deal. Like, you can <clears throat> buy a truck from Mr. Frosty and... Softy. Softy. So, oh, fuck. <laughs> Softy. God damn it. It's still around today. I think you can. Really? Should we get one for our neighborhood? Sure. <laughs> Mr. Softy Man. <laughs> we That's not a, weird at all. We have an ice cream truck that comes through. <laughs> yeah. Let's put them on business. I'm bringing back the old uh, wrestling ice cream bars. Remember those? Yeah. yeah. Those were delicious. Mm. It was just like a like a cookie, vanilla ice cream, and then like a chocolate coating back, and then had like that a picture. Good. It was always exciting. Like you open it, and what picture wrestler you're going to get? I just always liked the whatever had the frozen gumball eyes. I think nowadays it's like a SpongeBob one. Yeah, with like a there was Spider Man, Ninja Turtles, all kind of shit. The Ninja Turtle ones, I Pink Panther those. ones, I remember those. Good old days of candy cigarettes and yeah. Miss those candy cigarettes. You can still buy candy cigarettes. Can you? There's that candy store up the road where I buy Pokemon. Oh, do they have those there? Mm -hmm. You can actually blow them and like chocolate dust comes out like smoke. <laughs> yeah, they have fancy ones now. Like with like it's paper on it, but it's edible paper. Yeah. And like, but like if you like blow on it, like little puffs of chalky candy. Blow Is it on. gum? Because when I was kids, they had the regular candy cigarettes, but then they had the gum ones that had like the dust in there. I don't remember blow. if those were gum or not. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I remember it was terrible. It was not good at all. Candy cigarettes are delicious. The chalk things? Yeah. yeah the little white stick. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. The little red tip at the end, so it looked like you were lit up. <laughs> it's absurd. Can you imagine <laughs> that's what we give to kids? Fucking candy cigarettes. That's probably why they're hard to find now. They only have vintage shops. Yeah. Oof. Did the ice cream trucks back in the day have all that stuff? Do they have it now? Candy and stuff? I don't know. I don't know. Once so you yeah. inquire we, about a Mr. Softy when we franchise get, and see. Yeah, when we get a, a Mr. Softy franchise, we're gonna have like a whole like concession stand. Like try our hot dogs. They're the only thing not soft in here. <laughs> it's something like that. Because because we're soft, because we're around kids, and of course we're soft. Because why would we be hard? We're not pedophiles. It says it all on the side of our van. <laughs> it's like a little disclaimer down there. Nothing to see here, cops. <laughs> well, and instead of the music, we just play the show out the loudspeakers when you're driving around. Oh, there you go. You're pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Some cross promotion going on. Absolutely. <laughs> Bring your kids out. Fun for the whole family. <laughs> Pterodactyl noises. <laughs> That's the calling card of Mr. Softy. <laughs> <They hear. laughs> kids just start swarming out of their houses. <laughs> Chanting softy, softy, softy. We're waving hot dogs out the windows. That's quite a scene we've painted here. Yeah. All right, so that's uh, the demise of uh, Mr. Softy. Yeah, Richard said that he killed every friend that he had except for Phil Salamani. Mm. And that's true. Phil Salamani was the one that, you know, got the special agent close to Richard and was the downfall. So yeah. he cleaned house except for the one guy he maybe should have. Yeah. Mr. Softy, I don't think. It didn't sound like Mr. Softy was going to do anything against Richard. Yeah. You know, seemed a little unnecessary for him to. Overkill. Yeah. But why leave loose ends, I guess, right? Sure. And Mr. Softy wasn't a great guy either, so he was blowing yeah. up his wife's house. And <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> All right, you got anything else, Ian? We, we cover it? Yeah, I think I'm good at it. We covered the Iceman, Richard Kuklinski, till its fullest? Yep. Well done. I think so. We are on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube at Necronomapod, patreon.com slash Necronomapod if you're interested in all the bonus content, amazon.com slash Necronomapod, or amazon.com search Necronomapod if you're interested in all of our uh, clothing merchandise, and we still have the stickers available at Necronomapod.com. We have two packs and three packs available. Um, seems They seem to be pretty popular. People seem to enjoy them. Of course they do. So we got some new designs up there. So make sure you check it out. Appreciate it. See you next week. All right. You guys ready for a cool down beer? Cheers.